Okay, and good evening everyone. Welcome to our evening talk. We have a new meditator today from Winnipeg, who's actually an old meditator. And he's starting, finally, finally found the time to coordinate and do the full foundation course in our tradition. At the same time, we're losing a meditator, a graduate, who's just finished the foundation course passed with flying colors, graduated and moving on, but he'll be back. It's the thing about the Dhamma is it's addictive. Well, not really, is it? And that's the problem with the Dhamma, actually, is that it's not addictive. The problem with goodness is it, it's the opposite of clinging, and so you don't create an, an addiction towards it. But you do create an attraction. It's kind of a paradox in a sense. You do somehow become addicted to it. Addicted in, through wisdom. You appear as though you're an addict. A person can't stop meditating. You must be addicted to it, which is just a fool's way of showing their misunderstanding, their inability to understand, their lack of, well, or it's a superficial, just a superficial comment, but wisdom is a lot like addiction in that way. When you know something's right, you can't avoid it. When you know something's wrong, you can't take part in it. So congratulations for that. Apropos of tonight's talk, as tonight's talk, I was going to talk, well, I thought the topic would be desire, but there's a little bit more to it. The, um, to talk about the general concept of uh, the path. And I guess meaning the path of desire versus the path of renunciation. These are two way that, a way of understanding our options, because this is a, a true dichotomy. You can't. There's no in between. It's one or the other. Mahasi Sayada says they're diametrically opposed. I don't know what the actual Burmese words he used are. Probably not exact translation, but he says they're opposites. You can't do both. Or rather they lead in opposite directions, so most of us find ourselves in the middle being pulled in both directions. Sometimes engaging in enjoying nice sensations. You might have pleasant sights or sounds or smells or tastes or feelings. We might engage in them repeatedly. But at the same time we have a sense of the uselessness of sensual pleasures, the uselessness of desires and ambitions and so on. And so at the same time we engage in spirituality. We try to do both. But they're not complementary is the point. 
So the context is we were we had an interesting class last night on the theory of the study of religion. And it was on the question of whether whether phenomena like sports uh, s sports loyalty team loyalty or fandom the like the trekkies or the jedi knights our guest speaker was a Je uh, put down jedi knight on the census as his religion he explained why that was and actually there were i think somewhat unobvious reasons, non-obvious reasons for doing it, but the discussion was whether certain phenomena that appear to be quite religious or at least in, involving a great amount of sincerity and, and dedication, whether they could be called religious. And so I won't go into great detail. It was an interesting conversation. <clears throat> a couple of points that came up were um, well. The main point was that they don't touch upon anything meaningful. Could you argue that something has to touch upon what is ultimately meaningful? For it to be a religion uh, And so I, I mean I was the one who posed this And I su suggested that You could argue that something is only a religion And this is what the courts often argue There's been lots of challenges to the tax exempt status of religions And that it should include things like smoking marijuana Or it should include um, m vegan movements veganism or raw food movements it should include uh, the church of the flying spaghetti monster for example but they said that well these these various movements don't have a cohesive Doctrine that is sincerely held regarding ultimate questions of ultimate concern, the meaning of life, etc. Which, in the end, I think is an unfair assessment. But that's not the point. the The, the point in the end was that, well, loyalty to a sports team may seem quite uh, religious. And so I said, well, I can understand. I can except that it might be a religion, but it's a pretty silly religion, is the point. And this is the interesting point of it all. Not what is a religion and what is not a religion, but the fact that we can rank religions. We're not allowed to. And this is, this is sort of the real problem with the word religion, is that call something a religion and suddenly you have to respect it. Suddenly it's equal to all other religions, and so the concern with allowing something to be called a religion is that well then you have to respect it and who wants to think of fan worship of Captain Kirk as the same as the worship of Jesus Christ or Buddha or so on right they want to be able to s distinguish I, I don't think I'm setting up a straw man I think many people want to distinguish because they consider religion to be something in a category of its own, sui generis. That's Latin. It's a fancy Latin phrase that means of its own type. Something in its own, in a category of its own. And so where this is all going is the the recognition that there are many paths 
but denying that all paths lead to the same goal, that all paths are equally valid, that all paths should be considered equally, you know, be given the same sort of uh, attention. And so that led today, during my French lesson, I was talking to my French tutor and I gave him a lesson in Buddhism at the end, trying to explain it in French and then switching to English. And uh, well, his question was, why shouldn't you engage in enjoyable things if they make you happy? And he was trying to struggle with it and, and, and to, to, to argue, but be careful because he didn't want to threaten my religion. He didn't want to, you know, he obviously didn't agree with me, but he didn't want to get into a religious debate. So he phrased it like how things must be or, or that you can't do things but they, because they must, you can't do certain things because all things you do must be, must advance you as a person. I said, well, well no, actually, it's not like that. It's it's a question of what you want out of life, you know, and and where you're heading. I think this is what is unfamiliar to a lot of ordinary people is that there exists um, paths, there exist methods for that that lead beyond this ordinary state of existence that. Most people are intellectually comfortable with. Most people are intellectually comfortable with suffering. You know, they they are aren't physically or practically comfortable with it. They moan and complain like everybody else. But if you ask them, you know, hey, wouldn't you like to change the way the world works? You know. I mean, really, if you ask them, would you like to practice meditation? I've got this practice where you could become completely free from all the sufferings of life. Most people, I think, their their initial reaction is, you know, it's okay. Suffering is is okay. I, I'm okay with this. But really, what's what's saying that is the desire they have, an an attachment. Or, or many attachments to pleasures and to ambitions and so on. And then the ego behind it, the identification. So the idea of leaving behind samsara, the idea of nibbana is frightening, horrific even, abhorrent to most people, to not be born again. I mean, actually many people are dealing, are struggling under the delusion that we only have one life and to deny this, the pleasures of this life, this one life how horrible would that be? what a horrific thought So it's important to clarify, we're not talking about giving up happiness in order to give up suffering. We're not talking about an even trade here. These aren't on an equal footing. When we talk about the ordinary path of desire and aversion, it's the ordinary path of desire, aversion, anger, uh, delusion, that most people are on when we have all these things and engage in them regularly this is a very coarse path this is a f path that is fraught with problems and is, is working on a level of constant delusion of constant confusion and darkness lack of clarity, the mind for such an individual, for most individuals, is asleep, is uh, diffuse, distracted, 
muddied, muddled, all these things. Coarse. Constantly agitated, constantly excited and and uh, fraught with worry and fear and anxiety and stress. Even when a ch when a, when when seeking out the objects of pleasure, or even when attaining them, there is a distraction. There is a lack of clarity in the mind. And so really all we're talking about in Buddhism is not giving anything up per se, not, not, not directly. It's about a path that is on a higher level, and higher in a very pejorative sense, or whatever the opposite of pejorative is. It really is a pejoratively lower, that's even a phrase, it's a, it's a, it's a re truly lower path to, to seek out sensual pleasures. Hino gamo putu putu janiko analio anatta sanghito. The Buddha called it inferior. Gamo, the way of the village. All we're doing in meditation practice is creating a higher state of consciousness, a greater sense of clarity. And through the increase of clarity, things change. We refine our pursuits. We discard the pursuits that are clearly causing us stress and suffering and problem. Clearly now, now that our minds are more clear. It really is that simple. It's not a matter of deciding, should I give up happiness in order to be free from suffering? It's not at all like that. In fact, greater happiness comes, a more refined, pure, exalted, blissful, wonderful sense of happiness comes. Of course, my meditators are all like, yeah, right. I'm here torturing people in Canada, and then I talk about bliss and happiness. Well, our graduates know. Our graduates can tell you. It's a great struggle to rise above the rise above the dirt, the murk, to break free from the chains, the chains of desire. But it's a struggle unequivocally worthwhile. Unequivocally, undeniably worthwhile. And, and and this isn't just a, a claim that I'm making. I mean, this is really how we should understand the practice and how what should be clearly evident from the practice that we do. We're not judging. We're not even trying to change ourselves beyond the simple change of seeing our experiences, even our own minds and our own habits, clearly. Vipassana, seeing clearly. It's not some hard to understand concept. Things arise and cease. The ordinary state of mind is to to fare blindly, grasping and clinging to anything and cultivating habits with no rhyme or reason. Vipassana is like turning on the light. When you shine the light in, the darkness disappears. And you're, you're able to see quite easily. And suddenly quite clear come all the things that were previously mysterious. Why do I suffer? Why am I depressed? How do I free myself from desire and, ang and aversion? All become clear. So there you go. I mean, that's about all I had to say tonight. Just some food for thought. And I guess in, including the encouragement not to be 
not to lose lose sight of this or to lose faith or to be caught up in the pursuit of desire, the pursuit of, of ordinary happiness. To engage in and pursue clarity of mind, the ability to see things as they are more clearly than before. It allows us to refine our happiness and to create greater states of peace and goodness in our hearts and to free ourselves from all the troubles that come from evil, unwholesome mind states. So good for you, everyone. Keep up the good work. All right, there you go. That's the Dhamma for tonight. Thank you all. If anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you for coming everyone. I guess there are no questions. If there are no questions, we'll say goodnight then. Oh, and then there's a question. He started by mentioning meditation as addicting, and so my question is, when did the Buddha mention the path as being beautiful in the beginning, middle, and end, as we most often do not focus in the beauties of life? Yeah, the word isn't quite beautiful, it's Kalyana. Kalyana means good, bright, or beautiful would be soba, sub, suba. Suba would be beautiful, but uh, Kalyana is, uh, I can't remember the etymology, but it's a specific word. We use it for a friend, like a Kalyana Mitta is a beautiful friend, but it has nothing to do with their good looks. It's just a wonderful friend, an awesome friend. Uh, so Kalyana means good in the beginning And that's often translated in that way It's good in the beginning, good in the middle Adi Kalyana, Madje Kalyana, Pariyosana Kalyana Satang Sabayanjanang, Kevala Paripunang, Parisuddhang, Brahmacharyang It is the Brahmacharya that is uh, complete in both its letter and its meaning Meaning that there, all the teachings are there, and the meaning is is perfect. Kevala paripunang, totally and completely complete, parisuddhang and pure. The practice isn't addictive. I was trying to say it. It it seems addictive because people who engage in it, it's opanayika. It means it leads you on. The more you gain, the more you you um, are have the the inclination to gain or to strive for gain because of wisdom, not because of attachment.
Well, I've uh, I've posted a bug report for the broadcasting software that I use, and other people are confirming the bug. And they say just wait for the next version of this software to come out, unless I can figure out how to compile it, which is uh, it's a mystery to me how that works, but. Uh, There are ways of getting the software. Uh, anyway, so at some point soon, the point is I'll probably be doing live YouTube broadcasts again. Which doesn't mean we can't do Second Life as well, because I can always log into Second Life and just minimize it. It's the thing about Linux, it seems I can, I can port the audio to f like four different sources at once, which is kind of cool. I don't know if that happens in Windows as well, but anyway, let's end it there then. Thank you all for coming out. It's great to have a crowd every night. I'll try to be back here again tomorrow. <laughs>